from the BBC World Service in association with ABC and Akashvani. This is Stumped. Hello and welcome to Stumped, your intercontinental hit of news, features and debate from the quirky world of cricket. I'm Alison Mitchell and I'm in London where I've been a tourist in my home city this week, which is always a bit of fun. I've had a cousin visiting from Australia and I reckon we walked pretty much all of London town in the first day, culminating actually in a game of football soccer at Craven Cottage, home of Fulham. And they were taking on Spurs in the League Cups. So there was interest there from an Aussie perspective, of course, with Ange Postacoglu in charge of the Spurs side. So yeah, very much been a tourist this week and sort of between cricket series at the moment we're getting into the white ball stuff now that we're into September. Jim Maxwell in Sydney still in the cool of winter but there's a, a whiff of cricket around the place. Australia played a game in South Africa overnight and look to have a resounding win with a 220 odd runs scored and a big margin of victory under the leadership of Mitch Marsh and that well-known Singaporean otherwise an Australian Tim uh, David hit the ball out of the ground on a number of occasions. So uh, for what it's worth in these warm-ups towards whatever event it is they play in the end, it was an emphatic performance by Australia, just as I see it was an emphatic performance by England over in New Zealand. So cricket's sort of over there somewhere at the, at the moment in terms of the focus with Australian sport. Well, much more than a whiff, another flood of cricket in Asia. I'm Charu Sharma for Akashvani today in Dubai because the Asia Cup has started. And uh, yeah, there was a massive win for Pakistan in the first match against uh, the debutants Nepal. Hopefully they'll fare a little better as they go along. But I'm doing radio in Dubai for a change. Uh, big FM and talk radio. Apparently radio is very strong in the Gulf and I'm quite pleased to be here. And of course, I am in the studios of my hosts here. So, so far, so good. For We've started the tournament and of course, September, uh, Saturday, a couple of days from now is... Uh, the big one, India-Pakistan, that will certainly <laughs> provide some fire for the Asia Cup and uh, maybe the two teams will play again later. Who knows? Yeah, can't wait for that one, Charon. Radio is a special medium, so enjoy that radio commentary, won't you? Now, we're going to start this week with the climax to the 100, the Razzmatazz UK competition, where it's 100 balls a side. It's in its third season that's just finished, and a record crowd of over 21,600 packed into Lords for the women's final, which was played then just ahead of the men's. I was commentating for BBC TV, and it was third time lucky for Southern Brave in the women's, which meant the most perfect ending for former England fast bowler Anya Shrubsoll. And that crowd was a record attendance for a women's domestic game in the UK as well. Now, Anya Shrubsoll, already an England legend, that was her final match as a professional cricketer. And she once again got her hands on a trophy at the home of cricket, the same ground where she conjured up that famous six wicket haul to beat India in 2017 in the 50 over World Cup final. And Anya is with us on Stumped. Anya, great to have you on. What a fairy tale end that was on Sunday. How did you feel then on the day? Day and you know how, how do you feel now it was absolutely incredible I couldn't have um, asked for any more to be honest um, I often say that sport often isn't that kind to to kind of give you that the ending that you that you hope for and um, so I feel really fortunate that incredible actually to be able to play my final game at, at Lords kind of in a final and like I say made all the better by the fact that that we were able to win and um, yeah, it's certainly a day that that I'll never forget so we had you on the programme uh, last year after you'd retired from international cricket, uh, 227 wickets in 173 internationals for England. You've been a player coach uh, already in the domestic game. Um, how are you, I mean, we've had you in the commentary box with us as well. But how are you going to be spending your time now going forward? What's the aim? Um, just kind of see how how things land, to be honest with you. Um I don't want to rush into something else. I'm obviously um, stopping doing something that I've done for for my entire adult life. So, I think just seeing kind of how the how it lands, having a bit of a having a bit of a break, having a bit of a rest, um, and just seeing kind of where I want to go next. Like I said, I don't want to rush into things. Um, I want to see what I enjoy, see where my passion is, and and kind of go from there. When you look at the landscape, and I mentioned coaching because it's something that you've you've done, you know, already into good effect. There's not a lot of I mean, women coaches, sort of relatively speaking, in the game yet, is there? There's still quite a lot of males occupying those positions. Does it feel hard as a as a female coach to get those opportunities? How do you see that land lying? 
I'm obviously like pretty pretty new into it and just trying to to learn but I think it's I think it's part of the development of the women's game that we're seeing from a playing perspective I think you you're kind of seeing from a women's perspective as well and it will it will take some time I'm I'm a big believer that um you should only kind of be offered opportunities and and jobs and things like that when you're good enough um I don't think you should get it just because you're a woman or just because you're a man or just because you're you're whatever. You should get a job if you're good enough to do it. And I'm sure in time there will be plenty of female coaches who are good enough to coach in any team across cricket. Um, and that's kind of where you where obviously the game wants to get to. And I think we've still got to it's moving, like I say, from a playing point of view, from a coaching point of view, all of that in the right direction at speed. And I think it will continue to do that. And I've got no doubt, like I obviously I've worked with Lottie really closely and I see no reason why in time, if she wanted to, she could coach any cricket team she wanted to around the world. And That's Charlotte Edwards, um, yep. Yeah, Charlotte Edwards. I think that's it. she'd be able to do that in time if that's what she wanted to do. And equally, she... Um, might never want to do that. She might want to stay in the women's game. And I think it's it's also not seeing the women's game as, I guess, inferior inferior and a stepping stone to the men's game. It's a it's an excellent game in its in its own right. It's still cricket, it's still top level um cricket coaching. So it's it's I think we also need to be careful not to see um kind of the women's coaching in the women's game as a stepping stone to then the ultimate goal of being coaching in the men's game. And uh, Jim Maxwell here in Sydney. Uh, for a lot of people, uh, walking away from a sport after a lot of success, a lot of um, high moments. Uh, what support is there, particularly in the in the women's game, for for those that are looking to make the next move? Where where do you start? I think it's it's really different for everyone. I feel like I'm very lucky that I um, have very much. I guess I've both with international retirement and this, I've very much have chosen um, to retire. Um, and I feel really, really comfortable with that decision. I feel like I'm kind of at a point in my life where um, I, I really, I'm, I'm going to miss it, but I really want to retire. Um, I don't feel like I've been forced to. I don't feel, yes, my kind of, I've had some kind of injury issues that um, that haven't helped, but I actually don't think it would have made any difference. So from my point of view, I feel very fortunate in that. But obviously the PCA here in England uh, um, are a massive support in terms of um, whilst you're playing, when you're stopping playing in terms of helping you, I guess, navigate those next steps, um, what they may be. They've obviously got good connections with lots of different companies, organisations, and can really help you work out what it is you what it is you might want to do next. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've got a very supportive um, partner, a very supportive family who can, who help me with that as well. But um, yeah, I guess it's different for different people because some people are forced out of the game at kind of at short notice. And then that's a really kind of different discussion. Yes. We could have a yarn about Jimmy Anderson, but he hasn't retired yet. But um, <laughs> what advice might you give him if uh, he's thinking about what he's going to do next over the next uh, 12 months? I don't think he needs any advice from me, to be honest with you. Um, it seems like he's just going to keep playing forever. He's, it seems like he's got another 10 years till he has to worry about <laughs> this. But I think obviously there's there's obviously lots of things within. This is not just Jimmy full stop. There's lots of things within within cricket. He's obviously been, I've seen him around quite a lot doing commentary during the 100. There's coaching. If you, I don't think Jimmy Anderson will be short of offers <laughs> um, of people wanting to tap into his knowledge and things like that when he does finally hang up the boots in 20 years time. And the other thing which has come out uh, this week has been the increase in match fees for England women players, bringing them in line uh, with the men's England match fees. What's your reaction to that? I know you're out of the game now, but um, in, yeah, in terms of that move. Yeah, it's it's um, obviously a really important step forward. I think um, obviously the the ICEC report um, highlighted a lot of things and, and that was one of the recommendations. And it's really encouraging to see that that's kind of been taken up um, pretty quickly, and it's and it's just another step in in the right direction. Um, and I think you'll you'll keep seeing that um, in the years to come. Like I alluded to before, the women's game is moving forward, and it's moving forward at pace um, as it should do. Um, and there's still a lot, there's still a long way to go, but everything's moving in the right direction. Definitely here in England, in some countries around the world, and and I guess the hope is that um, some of the other countries who are maybe lagging behind as well will, will kind of will kind of pick up the pace as well because I think 
one of the most important things is having a really strong game globally. And I think that's how women's cricket as a whole um, moves forward. Always great to get your thoughts, Anya, on a, on a range of topics. Uh, love having you on. Congratulations on the 100, but also just a fabulous career, the longevity of it and everything that you've achieved as well. So look forward to seeing plenty more of you around the game. Thank you so much. That's England legend Anya Shrubsoll. Uh, well, Jim and Cherry, let's just pick up on uh, a bit more on the 100 because three seasons in, it was a controversial competition when it began. Uh, this year, uh, ticket sales are up, TV audiences are up, radio listeners, um, video clips on the BBC Sport website and app as well. How has the tournament, has it cut through much in India and Australia? Because it is starting to well, it has seen that growth over three seasons in this country. What about overseas? Well, it's certainly being shown on television in India. So there is that visibility. And whoever does uh, watch it on TV is aware that it's drawing more crowds because at the ground, of course, there's a fair amount of buzz, which is a very good start because if there's a buzz at the ground, you tend to on television also hang around a little longer rather than hit uh, that remote button. Um, and also, it looks like there's a fair amount of commercial support. So, And the sustainability of the tournament is now probably not in question because earlier, due to COVID, I think in a couple of the reasons, it was delayed, the start of it, which was a little inauspicious. But I think it's taken firm root in England. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it becomes your premier tournament uh, during the summer because it will be there uh, year in, year out. Um, I don't think the viewership in India was too high. Uh, but that's just because it's a relatively new tournament and there are no Indian stars, which uh, is probably a very difficult thing to overturn, at least in the, on the men's short side, run yeah. with the BCCI <laughs> on the men's side. Yeah. But Jim, there are quite a lot of Aussies who dropped out of the tournament early on that made headlines. But then actually there are quite a few that did play and did make headlines. So I'll, I'll give you the headline for the next Ashes in Australia. Spencer Johnson, the guy <laughs> who made his name in the hundred, right? Because he could be one of our guns in a couple of years' time. He's 27, but still he's he's just coming to a peak, it would seem, on what we've seen so far, and, and now again uh, in South Africa. Um, so that's a kind of Aussie positive. I can't see much else that excites the Aussies because this is the football season and the matches are on in the middle of the night. The one thing it tells us is that you've got to have some cricket on, um, but whether it's the 100 or the 2 or the 3, whatever you want to call it, you want cricket on free-to-air TV, and you want it on the radio, whatever it might be. I mean, you'd rather have test matches and one day, as I think, but um, I mean, at least it's some cricket. So no wonder the numbers are good. What else have they got to watch? Now on Stumped, history was made this week as the first ever red card was shown to a cricketer. Sonu Narine, the Trinbago Knight Riders spinner, who made that unwanted history by becoming the first cricketer to receive a red card during a Caribbean Premier League match. Now, the CPL Tournament Operations Director is Michael Hall, and he had said in a statement prior to the start of the tournament that they'd been disappointed that their T20 games had been getting longer and longer each year. He says, we want to do what we can to arrest this trend. And so one of these rules was introduced. Um, it was to bring in red cards, a first in the game uh, in men's and women's competitions to combat slow over rates, to make sure that teams are bowling you know, the overs that they have to bowl in the mandated 85 minutes in this case. The sanction means that a team loses a player from the field. That player is selected by the captain uh, and they must have six fielders then up inside the circle. If they lose one fielder from the uh, the team all together. So, Jim Charu, first of all, what do you what do you reckon to it? Now, all, all these things are worth worth trying. Now, you know whether it's the fielding side always, as we saw in the Ashes series, that it's to blame uh, for slow over rates. Batsmen get in the way of this too by mucking around with changes of gloves and other things. I don't know whether that happens as much in the, the speedy form of uh, the game, but. Yeah, I'd, I'd like I'd like to, to to see it tried and, and see what impact it has. If it has the necessary impact of getting people to keep the game moving, that's fine. Um, so yeah, it, if they get to the point of Test cricket, that could be very interesting. Uh, I had a good chat to Simon Torfel the other day, and he said one of the problems with uh, the Test cricket in particular is that the umpires in the middle aren't umpiring. They're really leaving every decision that matters to the bloke upstairs. And that has a fair bit to do with the fact that they don't have the best umpires doing the better games because they've got to have a limit of two from each country on the panel. So you, you've got a few things going into this, but essentially I like the idea on a trial basis. Yes, let's do it. 
Wow, Jim, I'm very impressed with your generosity because I thought you jumped all over the other way and said, what are all these cards doing in cricket? <laughs> but, you know, I also tend to agree. Uh, mind you, the only problem is the relative subjectivity of somebody with the stop clock. Because who's going to decide what is a legitimate delay and, and what is not? So mm -hmm. that will continue to be contentious. Uh, but I like the fact that somebody is trying to take control rather than just allowing this, you know, football style delay because it just serves no purpose. I mean, the fans may not mind too much, honestly. Uh, it's probably just the television companies which uh, are a little upset at the time going over. But... Uh, <laughs> On one hand, of course, you have to argue, what's the problem if the match gets a little delayed? But uh, because if television's happy to show it, just keep showing it. Uh, on the other hand, of course, if you want to be really strict, then there have to be such measures. And hopefully they're passed by the cricketer, the cricketing community as well, the current cricketers, because uh, their buy-in is important. And if mm -hmm. that's been done, uh, then, you know, I don't see a problem where there's cards which are very visible. So at least there's something visibly being done on the field rather than some backroom negotiation. And you get to hear the next day that there's been some kind of, uh, you know, fine or whatever. So on-the-spot treatment is pretty dramatic. And I think... Uh, if the intention is to keep the timelines pretty tight, well, then that's the way to go. I just wasn't sure about the language around it because I get that I, I quite enjoy that sense of drama about particularly the captain having to select which fielder goes off. I mean, how <laughs> how embarrassing is that going to be? You're, you're the one picked by the captain. So, yep, you're dispensable. Off you go. Um, but the, the idea of a, the red card, I guess because it's so prevalent in, in football, when I first saw the headline, Sunil Narine sent off red card, I thought, my, what's he done? What, what terrible misdemeanour has he committed that he's been sent off? So I think that language should change because that's a little bit, it's a bit misleading in the headline. Um, so I'm sure someone can come up with something, whether it's a, a substitution, but... Um, I don't know, a, a removal from the field or th there'll be something that somebody can think of. Um, but what about, do you think this could be introduced, Chariot, in the IPL? Because matches in the IPL just stretch on and on, don't they? Absolutely. I think it'll be a great addition. The crowd will love it. I'm sure the people consuming cricket will love it because it does give that sense of discipline and does cause a little bit of, if I may use the term, controversy, which is always useful for any form of the game for the media to crunch and everybody else. Uh, about uh, a player being red carded, perhaps it could be the team. The team's been shown a red card and so-and-so has been removed off the field. Maybe that's one one way out so that it, it, you know yeah. the team bears it's the responsibility as they should. But yeah, it's a good thing. I mean, any and all kinds of cricket should include uh, a, a visible instant system uh, rather than some backroom, God knows what kind of uh, decision uh, taken later. So this is preferable for sure. Fair to say that um, Karen Pollard, the skipper of the Night Riders, was not happy with what happened. I mean, and, and this is where everything gets fired up and it creates headlines and it's a talking point, isn't it? You see the passion. But yeah, he's labelled that new rule, rule as um, absolutely ridiculous, saying that he thinks it will just take away all the hard work everyone has done. But then, well, I, you know, I, I, work I harder at playing quicker. Yes, so sorry, I, you know, I, I do want to go back to the subjectivity of it because, I mean, they're, they're playing a hard game, the cricketers, these days. And, you know, in terms of a minor or major injury, who's to decide when it starts and how much time is consumed? And even the batsmen, I mean, you don't want to refuse them a pair of new gloves because the bat might fly away, the bat might turn in the hand, you get no second chances, you get caught somewhere just because the gloves are somewhat squelchy and you don't get to replace them. I mean, there's so many other considerations. So, I mean, this has to be really well thought out and extremely well... Uh, uh, mathematically uh, arranged. Otherwise, you know, there's too much subjectivity. Karen Pollard is that he hits the ball too far. You just want to hit it for six. <laughs> Don't hit it out of the ground. How much time <laughs> does that make? Well, do you know, I was about to say, when I was watching the 100 final, I think it might have been over Invincibles, at one point, one of their substitutes with the bib on was sort of patrolling around the boundary edge. And I swear he was helping to scoop up balls that were hit for fours and throw them back into the middle, which actually helped with the retrieval. So, I mean, whether that should be left to the substitutes, whether cricket should have more ball kids around the, the outer to help with the fielding and throwing the ball back in, that might help to speed things up a, a little bit as well. Obviously, if they go, you know, six rows back into the crowd, well, that's always going to take a bit of time, isn't it? But there might be ways of just quickening that up. Of course, if you're a team that is picking a an all-pace bowling attack as well versus, you know, a game where there's lots of spinners, well, it's going to take longer when you've got a lot of quick bowlers as well. So there's all those kind of parameters. And a team shouldn't really be penalised just by its strategy of, you know, which bowlers they're picking. But there's there's got to be a few little things that can also be done to speed up play. 
Well, that is it for this week's Stumped. I'll say thanks to Jim Maxwell and Charis Sharma. And of course, to all of you, make sure you join us again for more next week. Until then, bye for now.